Hello and welcome to the vlog, which this time round is coming to you from my engine bay. And that's because a few days ago I had a tweet asking if I'd ever done any videos specifically relating to boat batteries and boat electrics. And I thought back and I thought, well, I've kind of mentioned them in passing, but I've never really done a dedicated video about how all these systems, the electrical systems on the boat work. And so that's what this is. Now, I must stress that I am not an electrics expert, I'm not an electronics engineer, and certainly this video is not in any way supposed to be deeply technical. It is uh, glossing over a beginner's introduction, very much just the general gist of how stuff works. So if you do know boat electrics and you know your onions, you're probably going to think I've glossed over things and I've missed bits and so on, but that is intentional because this is very much supposed to be a beginner's guide. On the other hand, if you've just bought a boat and don't really know how stuff works, hopefully this will be of some use to you. Let's start with a look at the kind of electrical items that are typically on board. There'll be some lights for the dark evenings. There'll be a water pump to push water to the taps and shower. There'll be another water pump to suck out wastewater from the shower and chuck it overboard. There may be a pump to flush water into the toilet. If you have a central heating system, that'll take some power to run and to push hot water round the radiators. You'll probably have some ventilation fans in the galley and bathroom. You may have a fridge and even a freezer, and if you do, they're likely to be the biggest consumers of power on the boat. Perhaps you have a television or radio. Plus there may be some sockets for plugging in mains appliances or charging mobile phones and the like. There could be other things, but you get the gist. The thing to remember is that unless you're plugged into a main supply through a shoreline like in a marina, all the power you need has to be stored on board, and that storage is done in batteries. In fact, boats usually have multiple batteries, one to start the engine, another if you have an electric bow thruster, and then a set of batteries, usually called the leisure batteries, that power all the stuff I mentioned earlier, the lights and so on. Here's where it starts to get a bit technical. Batteries have both a voltage, measured in volts, and a capacity, measured in amp hours. A typical battery might be rated at 12 volt, 100 amp hours, but what does that mean in practice? Well, voltage is like the pressure at which the electricity is squirted around the system. The higher the voltage, the higher the push of the electricity. Meanwhile, amp hours relates to how much electricity the battery can deliver over a given period of time until it's got no more electricity left. This is where confusion often sets in, because amps and amp hours are not quite the same thing. An amp is essentially an amount of electricity known as current. An amp hour is that current being delivered over the course of an hour. So, for example, in theory, a 100 amp hour battery could provide one amp for 100 hours, or two amps for 50 hours, or 100 amps for one hour. In practice, it's not quite that simple because the more gently you try to pull the electricity out of the battery, the longer it can supply it for. Conversely, if you try and haul a lot of electricity out very quickly, it'll actually run flatter, quicker than the stated amp hours capacity would have you believe. Each bit of stuff on the boat requires a certain number of amps to work, so every time you switch something on, it's draining your batteries of that much current. Just to make things slightly more annoying, most electrical stuff is rated in watts. My old television, for example, uses 45 watts. To work out how much drain in amps that will put on your batteries, you divide the watts by the voltage of your batteries. 45 watts divided by 12 volts is 3.75 amps. So in one hour of TV watching, my battery will have drained by 3.75 amp hours. Two hours watching would use up twice that, 7.5 amp hours. Knowing what each item on board consumes and for how long you use each thing means you can work out how big your battery bank needs to be before you'll have to recharge it. This is called a power audit and is definitely worth calculating. There is, of course, a snag. Most conventional batteries don't like being drained of more than half of their power, 
So your 100 amp hour battery in reality only has 50 amp hours use in it before it needs a recharge. This is just down to the way that batteries work and there's nothing you can do about it. Worse still, as batteries age, their capacity decreases and it gets less if they're not charged properly or charged fully. Proper battery charging is quite complex and outside the scope of this video, but it's worth looking into. You can link multiple batteries to give you more capacity, but still the overall total is only half of what the batteries can hold. There are some types of battery, lithium for example, that can give up more before they need recharging, but they are fantastically expensive and they also need a slightly different care regime to your traditional boat battery. So quite simply for the purposes of this video I'm going to have to ignore lithium batteries. I should also mention that whilst I suppose most boat systems are 12 volt, you do occasionally find boats that run on 24 volts for technical reasons that again I haven't really got the time to go into here. And also some boats make up their 12 volts by chaining two or more 6 volt batteries in series. You can have a bank of batteries that's two lots of two 6 volts chained both in series and parallel to give you a large bank of 12 volt. There are a lot of ways of doing boat electrics. If you haven't already got a big headache, let's take a look at a typical setup for a boat. You'll have your batteries, let's say a starter battery for the engine, and a bank of three 110 amp hour 12 volt leisure batteries. That's a total of 330 amp hours, of which only half remember 165 amp hours is actually usable before you need to recharge, though if you can do it sooner the batteries will be happier. Recharging is most commonly done by the boat's engine. It has an alternator on it, just like a car, and the alternator makes electricity as the engine is running, and this is stuffed back into the batteries as you go along. You might also have solar panels on the roof. Depending on how many you have, these might generate a trickle or everything you need, and will do so silently all the time the sun is out. The more and bigger panels you have, the more electricity you make, and again, this is stuffed back into the batteries, generally in a more sophisticated way than the alternator does it, and that's kinder to the batteries in the long term. Of course, if you're in a marina, a wharf or such like, you could plug the boat into a mains shoreline and use a charger to top up your batteries. Just to throw a spanner in the works, it's also important not to overcharge your batteries as that can damage them. Other chargers could be an inboard or portable generator, and these come with their own requirements and issues which are beyond the scope of this video. The astute viewer will notice that mains electricity is 230 volts, but we've been saying the boat batteries are 12 volts. This is true. Also, mains is alternating current, or AC, while the batteries produce direct current known as DC. So when you plug into a shoreline, your charger takes the 230 volt AC mains and converts it down to 12 volts DC for the batteries. So why use 12 volts? Why not just have boats running 230 volts so it's like at home? Well firstly, batteries are DC, not AC, and secondly they're not very good at producing high voltages unless you stack loads of batteries in a big long line, each one giving the next one along a bit more push. But hang on, I hear you say, I do have mains voltage on my boat even when I'm away from the marina and I can plug in my hairdryer all I like. Yes, there are devices that can take the 12 volt DC from the batteries and convert it up to 230 volts AC so that it looks like mains electricity for your laptop or your toaster. These are called inverters and they come in a range of sizes and power outputs. The quality of their output can also vary, and some mains appliances can either not work or even be damaged by poor quality inverter mains. Just remember that the electricity is still all coming off your batteries, so if you plug in a microwave oven and it draws a thousand watts, while that's only just over 4 amps at mains voltage, it's 83 amps at the 12 volts your batteries are supplying, and that's what's crucial. If you run the microwave for, say, six minutes, you'll have drained your batteries by at least 83 times a tenth 
a tenth because six minutes is a tenth of an hour. So that's 8.3 amp hours from your storage. That draw from the microwave may not sound like a lot coming out of our example bank of 165 amp hours, but bear in mind that what's in the batteries is all you've got until such time as you're able to recharge. So unless you've got solar or a generator or you're running the engine every day, the storage of your electricity is just going down and down and down. So you're probably unlikely to be able to use big high current appliances like electric heating or irons and hair dryers and toasters and washing machines and things like that. There are boats that are specifically designed to be all electric and they have big battery banks and big inverters and they can deal with it. And sometimes you can get away with running large current appliances by running the engine at the same time. So effectively the engine is powering them rather than the batteries. What's more, inverters are inefficient. They lose some power in the process of converting it. Maybe around 10 or even 20% could be worse in poorly made inverters. So your 8.3 amp hours drain might be, let's say, 10 amp hours used up, or even more. And inverters use up some power just by being switched on, even when they're not doing anything. That's why it's generally better to charge things like your phone from a 12 volt charger, like those car cigarette lighter things. Better that than it is plugging in a mains charger through the inverter. Let's go back to our diagram. Like all batteries, you have a positive side and a negative side. Electricity flows when one side is connected to the other, and that's what you're doing when you switch something on. You're making that connection. The first thing to say about this is that you should never, ever let anything that conducts electricity directly touch both terminals on a battery. For example, if you are undoing the connections and your spanner accidentally touched both sides, positive and negative, if that happened, all the electricity in the battery would try to cross through the spanner in one go. You'd effectively create a one bar electric heater across the terminals. There'd be a big bang, an almighty spark and lots of damage, including possibly to you. For that reason, only muck about with boat electrics if A, you know what you're doing and B, you're careful. The reason this doesn't happen when you switch on a light and let the electricity flow is that the light has a resistance to the flow. It holds it back so it can't all move at once and you don't get the big bang. Everything electrical aboard the boat will have two wires going to it, one from the battery positive and one from the negative. Usually there's a switch in the positive line to turn things on and off as well. At the battery, all the negative terminals are connected together and connected to the hull of the boat. This is your earth, even though you're actually on a boat in water not connected to the ground. The engine will also have a big thick wire connecting to the hull to earth it. Incidentally, unlike cars, boats need the negative wire to run all the way back to the battery from everything that's being powered. You shouldn't just connect to the hull and use the metal hull as the return path, otherwise you could end up corroding it. In each positive line emerging from the battery, there will, or there jolly well should be, a fuse. Fuses are crucial because in the event of a bit of wire, say, chafing somewhere in the boat and causing a short circuit, it's the fuse that will blow up and disconnect the power, rather than a fire breaking out in the chafed wire and potentially setting your boat on fire. If a fuse blows and you replace it and it blows again, that pretty much almost certainly means something has a fault on the circuit and that needs to be diagnosed and fixed. Don't just stick a bigger fuse in to make the circuit work or again you could end up with a fire on board. You'll also find somewhere near the batteries a big red switch, possibly two of them. These are your master switches which turn off all the 12 volt power from the batteries to the boat. You need to turn these off if ever you do anything to the wiring so that it's not powered up while you're changing things. But bear in mind that even with those switches off, your mains charger and solar panels might still be connected to the batteries, as well as things like automatic bilge pumps, which you always want to be able to run. And whilst the isolator switches should turn off your inverter, if your boat is plugged into a shoreline, the main sockets on board could still be live. 
And that'll do, I think, for this beginner's guide to boat electrics. There's loads more that could be covered, of course, but maybe I'll do future episodes or something. If you have any questions, don't drop them in the comments down below. It's the wrong place, and I'm certainly not the person to answer them. Instead, I strongly urge you to join the 12 Volt Boating Group on Facebook. Yes, even if you hate Facebook, it is worth going on it just for this. There is a huge wealth of information there, particularly from the group's administrator, Phil Brook Little, to whom I'm also indebted for having a read through of my script for this video before I recorded it. You will get every question you could possibly want to ask answered knowledgeably on that group. I'll leave a link to it in the video description below. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.